Okay, thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, maybe not so novel. As Dave was saying, I never teach language, he was saying. And I guess that's part of what I was doing. Just a little bit of background. Both uh, I and Dave Voorhis used SAS in a, a previous existences. And back in the 1985, I led the creation of what was probably the largest, most powerful project management system in the world, written in SAS and ISPF and TSOC list and a few other things. It's a funny language, it's SAS, because the raw SAS, because you can do really weird things with macros and with SAS that can write SAS code and generate yet more SAS code, and it kind of just does things. It's also very easy to learn. And Dave used it when he was up in Canada, where he comes from, in a university there as a in his consultancy role, doing data mining and um, such like. <clears throat> so we both have a similar background, and that's why we've been working for, or driving for, or trying to drive, should I say, for the last five years to get SAS into the university so we can do our own research in a language which is cr sensible rather than all these odd things like C, triple sharp plus or something, or even PL1 or Fortran. SAS is much better. So we've been trying to do this, and we had a BSC program called BSC IT, Information Technology. It runs within the School of Computing and Maths, but it's for those, it was designed for those who didn't want to program. They were more interested if we use the um, enterprise architecture level, say the Zachman one, the top two levels. So we're looking at the designer, owner, architect levels for our BSC IT students, whereas the CS, Computer Science, is there down levels three and, or four and downwards. So we're trying to differentiate very, very distinctively. But the problem was, they came out feeling, mm, when we're trying to apply for our gap year, our sort of bit, a whole year out in business, we don't feel we've got too many easily saleable um, skills. And as we started to look at this, we thought, well, why don't we get SAS in? Because that's kind of interesting. It's a, in Britain, high, in a very high demand, and I managed to get, when I found the sort of jobfinder.com or .co.uk with SAS and found the salary levels there, I just said to the students one day, they've been a little bit sort of problematic and not engaging too thoroughly. I said, just go to this link. And suddenly they crawled into the tube to sort of, or the screen, thinking, plus 15,000 sterling, that's $25,000 a year. And suddenly, instead of vanishing at sort of at half an hour before the end of the workshop, they were there for another three hours. So that's kind of part of the background of what we were doing. I'm also going to show you something which I'm not sure that many of you will have seen, a way of specifying an assignment, which is the whole of the module, totally goal-directed. And I kind of use a flipped approach. Typically, for the sort of work I'm doing or teaching, things like sustainable information corporate governance or IT services management or this particular module, I do not write much in the way of lecture slides. I have a, run a seminar, perhaps for an hour or maybe two hours, and then a workshop, which might be one or two hours, 20, 20 pit st students maximum in a computer lab, so they're online the entire time with proper desktop PCs with proper keyboards and all of that sort of stuff. So they can actually create all the time. They're researching and so on. I kind of use a flipped approach, except I don't bother with the overnight video that they can read or look at the day before, because we all know that students actually don't do very much outside of the contact time, most of the time. Do they? I'm talking about undergraduates here. Uh, well, mm, not necessarily. I've talked to a lot of graduates, and they tend not to do too much if they can avoid it as well. It's kind of bizarre, because they're probably from overseas, and they're probably trying to do sort of some part-time work as well. So it's an interesting exercise. What we did in this particular module was to give them a remarkably minimalist um, specification and they were pointed in the direction of some resources about using, learning to use SAS to show them how simple it was. I use the, there's a, a rather lovely website out at UCLA 
uh, which has lots of interesting self-tutorials and examples, cut and paste or copy paste, and it's absolutely superb. So this, was, um, this is a module, Data Management and BI. So the data management was actually with the seminars were run by a colleague who's all into, in, involved in databases and so on, data management. And he ran the uh, two-hour seminar, and I just ran the two-hour workshop on the, <coughs> the SAS side. And the other point I made was uh, earlier, BSEIT students went on the program because they didn't wish to do compute, uh, programming. They had very low aptitudes for programming. So that's the UCLA um, website, and it demonstrates just how remarkably simple it is to get data into the system and very, very quickly start producing useful uh, output, whether statistics using one of the PROC procedures or using a PROC G chart or things like that. So it's incredibly simple because SAS knows the structure of the data once you put it into it. It knows everything about the data, all the metadata that's necessary, and it's really quite remarkable. And within 10 minutes or so of giving them that, and also they were able to start doing useful stuff. The assignment itself was in two hard, or two parts. A f to create the classic back of the fag packet um, specification that they would tend to get from their bosses when they're out in the real world of business. In fact, it was actually a bit more than that. It was 1,500 words in five sections that they had to think a bit about who the stakeholders were, the sort of information or sort of answers they could get from the data which I prescribed to them. And uh, the data was actually some public uh, transparency data from the National Health Service in the UK, um, and a set that, a data set that is produced every month of all hospitals um, and the length of time the patients waited from the time they were referred by their GP to the hospital until they got treated. And there, should, there were targets of 18 weeks treatment. And it gives the profiles. And if you effectively fully normalize the data into a long, thin type of data set, you've got something like over the two years' worth of data they were supposed to be collecting or using, something like about several million records. So it's getting into the class of biggish data for students to play with. And they had to look at the data in its raw form, because that's the most useful form, to work out, because the way the data is classified is by the type of illness and the hospital, the um, trust, hospital trust that they were in, and various different um, sort of aggregations. And they had to think about who were the, the stakeholders, was it the government, was it the individual patient wanting to look at an individual hospital or a group of hospitals to see you know, what the typical treatment times were likely to be? Were they going to be 18 weeks in the queue or perhaps was it going to be five weeks? So there are a lot of things they could think about in developing a little specification. And then eventually the main part was to create in SAS a little application which would have... A, at least two to three months' worth of data stored in up to 24 months in various different styles or standards, and then they were to be able to produce three different sort of reports answering different sort of questions from that data uh, that were useful to their chosen stakeholder. Now, I, this was the criteria, the, most of the specification. They were told it had to be related to their spec, and then I gave them the percentage bands that we mark by in the university now, which is in 10% bands, and two criteria, the coding and use of SAS for 50% of, the, the, of this grade for this particular part, and the data structure that they were supposed to be using, and I'll go to the, oops, sorry, wrong one. Um, this one first, because 40 to 49% is the pass level. So I started at that level and said, this is what you must have when you demonstrate to me at the end of the semester. This is what you're going to do in terms of the SAS side and its interface and its results. So in other words, this is the functionality you've got to deliver to me. And the right-hand side, remember, is the data structure. So 
It was basically the primary care trust data for several months, two or three months, in the CSV, or well, actually it wasn't CSV, it was actually closer to Excel um, with six tabs across the bottom for the different sort of aspects of data. So they have to pre-import it. They can't just import it at runtime. So I can see in their run, in their demonstration, here are some SAS files sitting in there, and that's pass level at data. And here's some, they've got on their memory stick some chunks of SAS code which they suck into this SAS environment and run it. And it produces bog standard, three specified sly, uh, you know, wavy line type of output. To do better than that, they have to start thinking about getting more data in there. So, oh, the wrong one again. They've got to get several types of tabs of data in from the there. So there's more data in that they can actually do a bit more comparing, contrasting, perhaps, or answer slightly more interesting questions at different levels within the health service environment. But the different, or part of the difference here, they're getting some choices. They're having to provide choices in output styles. They have to start thinking a little bit about almost menuing somehow or other nearly. So if we go back now to the top two bands, this was a really seriously challenge because at this level, they're now beginning to think about normalizing, to, so certainly third normal, and probably beginning to start thinking about going away from third normal to so the other normalization levels, which are optimizing space or time. So you're getting towards sixth normal type of concepts. Now, I was running this in parallel. No, the term after, a colleague of mine, in fact, Dave Voice himself, had been teaching them databases. And it was remarkable how little they seemed to have remembered about normalization. I have actually spent a lot of the workshops reteaching them and redirecting them at normalization and normalization. Not teaching them SAS, but the stuff that they'd gone in one ear and out the other ear. And so you can see the differences between the 89% 89, 89 band and there, and they're really getting some pretty heavy data, database capability. And here, we're getting into menuing, uh, menu systems, um, both in terms of menu-driven uh, data selection and here, menu-driven um, selection of the output, graphs and so on. Now, I knew how to do that one when I wrote this spec, and I knew that I could have done that 15, 20 years previously when I was at Rolls-Royce, um, but I really wasn't entirely sure I could remember how I would do it. What was interesting, all the way through this, I gave them no teaching at all in SAS. They got the UCLA stuff, and we had got them all of the relevant manuals. And we, we eventually got the 160 manuals on a CD or DVD uh, so they could get at them. So they had the base SAS manuals. They had all the other stats manuals and graphics manuals and so on. And they were just exploring. They knew where they were trying to get to. And they could choose that level, that level, or all the way down. They could, some of them just chose, I'm going to go for 40%. That's all I want to do with this one. Others started getting uh, kind of exploratory. What was fascinating was the majority did use the ordinary stuff I would expect. The stuff that we would have taught if we had done the traditional teaching of a language. Here's the syntax, here's the grammar, here's some examples and to work through, blah, 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 blah and they kind of get a bit bored. What was bizarre and very, very surprising, six of them used completely unexpected areas of SAS. Two of them decided that in spite of the ease of using SAS in pro, pro, um, the import facilities and then just SAS to do things, they decided, no, we're going to use SQL. We learned SQL a little while ago, so we'll use ProcSQL and five th about four or 5,000 lines of code later. <laughs> well, because, if you, you know, because you tend to sort of put in the, sort of one word per line or one variable per line, so it sort of builds up rather fast. But what was really spectacular, once you found the SAS uh, AF manual, <clears throat> which has somewhere buried in it, I think on page eight, 
I think it's page 84 from memory, there's a chunk of code which shows how to build a menuing system. And it gives you all the code that's necessary, well, the majority of the code that's necessary to do it, but then you've also got to put all sorts of things behind it, and it's not entirely obvious how you do that. And five or six of them, no, four or five of them, sorry, found the way to run SASAF. I think somebody found it first and then shared the basis of it with them, and then they developed the back end that sort of sat, sat hidden. What was also interesting, so the, the, the really interesting thing, thing, I suppose, was that they found it. It's the sort of thing none of us would ever have taught them if we were teaching a language. You know, maybe we teach R or we teach Java or whatever, but we don't always leave it completely exploratory. But they really did get very, very enthusiastic. This is an example, actually, of one of the, um, or screenshot of the sort of functionality. Now, what's interesting to me is this is part, in, in embryo, what we see now in the latest flagship offering from SAS, SAS Visual Analytics. It works in this sort of mode in the, in the Explorer functionality. And you can see how they've actually developed it. And this guy produced that. Now, that's the code produces that automatically, but to be able to find that was something I thought was really pretty spectacular. Now, teaching it like this, and I only taught them for about eight or ten weeks of the semester for a variety of reasons. That guy, the failure, was, uh, had various personal issues and wasn't able to do very much, but all the rest had passed. That's an interesting profile. What was also interesting, that same group with a different uh, lecturer on a different module, most of that lot and that lot failed his module because he taught it in the usual didactic sort of fashion. What was also interesting is that in Britain we have a little bit of a problem what we, which we call diversity these days. It's, um, it's actually to do with the comparison in outcome or of our white Caucasian UK students versus everybody else, the BMEs, the black uh, minority ethnic groups, plus internationals. In many universities, there's 10-15% um, differential. On this one, the white Caucasians or UK Caucasians averaged grade was 3% lower than the rest. I thought it was interesting that these are the three key points, I think, that come out of flipping it around and changing the way we look at engaging students, getting them to remember to learn, apply themselves, all those things that we have huge problems with if we stand up in front and lecture. Turn it around and we get some, something very, very interesting. So thank you for that. There's one little thing I agreed with uh, Susan, I'd say, before I finished and opened up to questions. We talked a lot about some very interesting things, folks, um, not just about teaching and our curricula, but also about the whole place of big data analytics and all the things that are going on. Now, I'm very, very interested, and I want to get a book together, because there's no book like this on, in the market at the moment, which I'd like to entitle Big Data Analytics, Ethics, Trust, and Governance. And so if anybody's interested in contributing a chapter, come and have a chat, because I think there are so many questions about the ethics which are involved in, A, the collection of uh, data, which we can see around what we're talking about. We also see problems of ethics in presentation of data. You know, there's statistics like, oh, Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And, you know, false origin is dead easy way of fiddling the message. So I think there's a lot to be done in terms of ethics and governance. You know, the governance issues we've seen with Facebook, with, well, various governments as well in various approaches. And so I think there's a, an interesting place for a book on this one. So thank you, folks. Thank you, Susan.